Hello everyone! I've got another nostalgic video for you today, as we're going to discuss a movie I saw many times as a child, 1985's Return to Oz. This film assumes that its audience is familiar with the events of the 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz, and picks up the story six months later. Dorothy Gale, played by Feruza Balk, won't stop talking about the magical land of Oz and the friends she made there, who she insists were all real. Her fixation, and her inability to sleep, so disturb her Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, Piper Laurie and Matt Clark, that they bring Dorothy to a psychiatric clinic to be evaluated by the inventor of an electric healing device. Dorothy's just about to undergo terrifying treatment when a thunderstorm cuts the power, and she's rescued by a mysterious girl she's had visions of who leads her to a river. After a night of drifting, she wakes to find herself back in Oz, accompanied by her now-talking chicken. But something's happened in her absence. Malevolent rulers and their minions have taken over and devastated the Emerald City. Now it's up to Dorothy Gale from Kansas, with the help of some new friends, to put things right. To anyone who might be thinking Return to Oz is an odd choice for this time of year, <laughs> have you seen Return to Oz? It's perfect for this time of year. It's got nightmare fodder in spades. It's mentioned at one point that in the real world it'll be Halloween soon, and there's a character named Jack Pumpkinhead. I know this movie's very existence rubs some people the wrong way. Maybe the more attached you are to The Wizard of Oz, the less receptive you will be to this. Uh, it's not a sure thing, but chances are pretty good that, uh, <laughs> that you will take a, um, take a firm stance against this movie. Um, I do know it's never enjoyed as much popularity as some other 80s fantasies, which are similar in a lot of ways, but they stand on their own, whereas this will always be compared to The Wizard of Oz. And in a way, I think those comparisons are unfair. This is an unusual film that dares to be a partial, I repeat, partial sequel to one of the most adored, most watched films of all time, but it also dares to be entirely different. There's absolutely no singing, for one thing, and it's generally darker and more serious in tone, although there are light moments, absolutely. It doesn't have the same vibrant technicolor and cheeriness, and everything you expect to see in Oz when you get back there is absent or changed or destroyed. <laughs> But I find that an effective tool to help the audience relate to the protagonist. Here's Dorothy finding herself back in Oz, hoping to reunite with friends, and instead she's shocked to find the city in shambles, its residents turned to stone. The expectant viewer, going in with fond memories of the old movie, feels the same disorientation and dismay. No. Unlike The Wizard of Oz, which I've heard strayed quite a ways away from its source material, Return to Oz sought to adapt the second and third entries in L. Frank Baum's 14-book series, combining characters and storylines from The Marvelous Land of Oz and Ozma of Oz into one cohesive narrative. It's a lot to squeeze in, and takes just under two hours to do it, but it keeps things moving with a steady focus. We saw it because my mom taped it off TV, and it became one of my sister's particular favorites, which is how I ended up seeing it so much, and it's turned out to be one of our family's most quoted movies. Uh, some place for a chicken coop. Poison. Poison. Poison indeed. To tie my feet together. Deadly desert. Isn't that a chicken in there with you? The Gnome King? 
doesn't allow chickens anywhere in Oz. Ten-year-old Firuza Balk makes her feature film debut. She was thrilled to win the hotly contested role of Dorothy Gale. She is significantly younger than Judy Garland was, despite the dreadful things that were done to try to de-age her, and therefore she's the appropriate age for the character as originally written. I'm sure the young star felt the burden of having to carry the movie while following in such iconic footsteps, but I think she did a fine job. She's got the look, more importantly, she's got the personality. Dorothy's a well-behaved, thoughtful child who has ready sympathy for those in distress and will stand up to pressure. As it was in the old film, the imaginary land of Oz is both an exaggerated reflection of the real world and an escape from a distressing reality, one where Dorothy's weary, struggling relatives leave her at a disturbing place where they want to zap her brain, and damaged patients can be heard screaming in the cellar, and the only way she can get away is by nearly drowning. But resilient Dorothy presses forward, and on her adventure she makes a new group of friends, unusual companions who are even more ramshackle than the old ones. Replacing Toto as Dorothy's animal buddy is her chicken, Bellina, who, now that she can talk, turns out to be a wisecracking pessimist. Look, Bellina, these ones have lost their heads. Well, that's what I call just plain carelessness. Bellina was played by 40 real chickens and one mechanical one. Jack Pumpkinhead is a towering, gangly figure created to inspire fear in the villainous Mombi, but really he's a sweetheart who wants Dorothy to be his mom. He's a mess and not too bright, but he's a good kid. Visually, this character was an inspiration for Jack Skellington in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Did you understand all that, TikTok? I understand it better than you do. TikTok is a mechanical man, a clockwork member of the Royal Army of Oz, and mighty proud that he's not a human. He's clever and a good strategist, as long as his thinking gear is wound up. Oh, yeah, if his brains ran down, how could he talk? It happens to people all the time, Jack. And the gump is a green moose's mounted head. <laughs> like Bellina, he also has a tendency to be pessimistic, and he's embarrassed about all the things that are being done to him. So it falls on Dorothy to keep the team together and headed in the right direction. And she does so with a great attitude. Whenever someone lets her down, as she's running for her life, she makes sure to tell them, That's alright, can't be helped now! You get so used to these new characters that when you do finally see familiar faces again, they are the ones that feel like strangers. It doesn't help that there is kind of an uncanny valley thing going on here. I believe the designs of the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodsman, and the Cowardly Lion are more reflective of the original W.W. Denslow illustrations than the 1939 film. Unfortunately, the roles these characters were meant to play here had to be greatly reduced due to budget cuts, and I'm sorry to say one of the weakest points is the look of the Scarecrow. The voice is fine, and the body's okay, but on closer inspection, he's kind of hideous. <laughs> All the other fantastical beings have wonderfully expressive faces that enhance their personalities, but they ran out of money before they could do the Scarecrow and had to compromise with this fixed expression. So he looks a little freaky with dead, motionless eyes. Most of the characters required an entire team to bring them to life. Artists, animators, puppeteers, stunt people, actors who gave them voices. This was quite an effort, so it's no wonder that the budget ballooned. Um, there were all kinds of visual and special effects employed. The visual effects team earned an Oscar nomination. They didn't win, they lost a cocoon. We have models, matte paintings, optical effects, mechanical props, and the then relatively new claymation by Will Vinton, who trademarked the term. And for the most part, I think it looks really good. It's different from the old movie. It's It may not be as glamorous and as glitzy, um, and if you put them next to each other, a side-by-side -side comparison would probably put this one at a disadvantage, but 
I think it has a remarkable quality of its own. Return to Oz was directed by Walter Murch, who co-wrote the screenplay with Gil Dennis. Murch's primary calling is as a sound designer and film editor. He's known for his work with Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas, he's a three-time Academy Award winner, and has been nominated a bunch of other times for both sound and editing. He also assisted on the reconstruction of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. To date, Return to Oz is the only film he's directed, and he almost didn't get to do that. Disney fired him just one week into the production because the project was getting too expensive and moving too slowly. It was Coppola and Lucas and Spielberg and other friends intervening on his behalf that got him rehired, though Disney continued to undermine the film in my opinion. <laughs> they did little to promote it and shortened its theatrical run, so it made a paltry 11 million compared to the 28 million it took to make. So thanks, at least in part, to Disney, it went down in history as a box office bomb. Anyway, while Merch didn't give himself credit for sound or editing, I'm sure he was heavily involved, because he's the director and generally director gets last say on things, but also because the editing is sharp and sound plays a tremendous role here. One of the first things I think of whenever this movie comes up is the skin-crawling squeak of the wheelers. It's one of those things that we say in this family. Whenever we hear a squeak like that, a squeak going down the hall, we get a cart that has a squeaky wheel in a grocery store. Beware the wheelers! A lot of people were frightened by the flying monkeys in the 1939 movie when they were kids. The wheelers are kind of like this film's flying monkeys, only more psychotic. They've got speed, spooky metal masks, nasty dispositions, appropriately wacky outfits too, natty bow tie and shirt front, sparkly multicolored coat and tails, spray painted hair. Are they the scariest thing in the movie, though? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's talk about Mombi for a second. She's fun. Jean Marsh plays a significant dual role as the nurse at the clinic and as Princess Mombi's real head. I have to specify because she has multiple heads and she keeps all of them locked up in glass cases. Dorothy Mombi is scary because, uh, so many reasons. Do I really need to explain this? <laughs> she is a beast. Besides the whole thing where she can replace her head with someone else's and they're all in their cases screaming at Dorothy, and we actually see her standing there with no head, I can't believe that they showed that in a kid's movie. She's also cruel and vicious, and I love how Jean Marsh just throws herself into the part, bellowing threats and orders with the most deranged expression on her face. Plus she's wearing a doozy of an outfit. You gotta be careful with that thing. You might skewer someone's eyeball with the headdress. I think number four will do for this afternoon. But as bad as she is, from early on, just about the moment that Dorothy arrives in Oz, we know Mombi isn't the big boss. Even she is subject to the Gnome King. Our first introduction to him is just a voice and a reflection of hellish flame as a nervous underling, a face that appears on rocks, reports on Dorothy's whereabouts. That's all we need to know that he's a spooky character. Acclaimed British star of stage and screen, Nicole Williamson appears on screen as quack Dr. Morley and also provides the voice of the Gnome King. We don't actually meet him until later on, and like Mombi, he's deceptively polite at first, but it's all just a front to lure in his prey before slamming the trap door shut. And while the journey through his underworld dominion is another part of the film where I think the effects falter, they make up for it with the Gnome King's gradual transformation. It's subtle at first, so subtle that I suspect I never fully got it as a kid. I just knew that 
Something was happening, and it was really creepy. This is the part of the film that gets really dark, and Dorothy is tempted with a devilish bargain. But that's not even the end of it, because the finale has the whole palace coming alive with stone gargoyle things that are absolutely horrifying for a timid child, and the Gnome King becomes this gigantic, vindictive monster. And I can testify that this imagery sticks with you. If you can accept that this is a different animal from the 1939 film and not spend the whole movie making comparisons, it's a good time. It's fun, it's whimsical, it's creepy. <laughs> it's got good music composed by David Shire with some lovely violin solos. And Feruza Balk does a good job making Dorothy her own. So much time had gone by since I'd last seen it, I don't even know how long it had been. And I think the influence of some harsh internet criticism had made me start to think that it wasn't as good as I thought it was when I was a kid. But the movie's better than I remembered, even more now that I can appreciate how much work went into it, and how much creativity, and how much forethought went into all the little details that cross over from real life into the fantasy. I absolutely recommend this film. Maybe not to little kids, I'm not in the business of traumatizing children, but to older kids and uh, to adults, certainly. I think in some ways adults will get more of a kick out of it than kids will. I don't know, I don't know what kids like. Heading into this review, which I wasn't even sure I was going to make, I had no idea what my viewpoint would be, but having revisited the film, my faith in it is restored. Is it perfect? No. It has some, some awkward, shaky bits. Is it surprisingly heavy at times? Yes. <laughs> is it gonna put some people off? Yes. Will diehard fans of the old movie find it um, off-putting, disappointing, whatever? Probably. But I think it's got strong appeal of its own, if you just give it a chance. And those are my thoughts on Return to Oz. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think of this movie, if you've seen it, in the comments below, and I'll be back next week. Thanks for watching!